the reconstruction procedures are crap. So that's, that's why I'm sort of a bit more aggressive about making a diagnosis. Rightly or wrong. Right. Osteochondral lesions of the talus. Again, same. I'd like to acknowledge Jeff for some of the slides, the video, and the ongoing debate we have about the role of chondrocyte grafting and some of his ideas. So this, just a definition thing, this is important. So this is an adult talk, not a children's talk. So children get osteochondritis dissecans where just some of the bone just dies sometimes. Okay, and we don't really know why and people suggest all sorts of things. But the great thing about mysteriously dying is they mysteriously come back to life. And so in children, we call holes in the bone osteochondritis dissecans. And in a sense, that's prognostic because we think it's going to get better and up until it's a little maturity, the majority of these do. Whereas adult ones, they don't go so good. And that's why you can call them osteochondral lesions instead of osteochondritis dissecans. Well, they're fundamentally, <coughs> when you look at the scan and things like that, they don't look a hell of a lot different. So that's what we're talking about. That's what you get at arthroscopy, where the surface is covered up with some fibrocartilage and stuff like that, or in this case, you know, the whole fragment's loose and you know, I've actually removed a piece of loose chondral tissue. So how do these happen? Well, in large-scale reviews, the majority of people do remember a reasonable traumatic event. Having said that, there is a fair bit of recall bias in, oh, you've got a hole in your tail, do you ever remember an injury? Well, you do remember an injury at some stage in your life. But probably this is still a largely traumatic problem. Okay? The lateral ones particularly seem to be more traumatic. Uh, more often associated with um, a trauma. It's the postromedial ones that tend to well, seemingly occur more spontaneously, okay, without the survey history of them. Um, and most of them in the, are in the sort of the central uh, central third. Right. So with the atraumatic ones, we're really not sure more the the traumatic ones are pretty obvious. You, you know, fall and you make a hole in the bone. Uh, the atraumatic ones, we're not sure why they occur, whether it's related to you know, local vascular abnormalities and things like that. The incidence of this, so if we look at the incidence of chondral injuries in the traumatic group, in patients that have routine scope, I'm a, I'm a routine scoper as well for all my lateral ligaments, chondral lesions have been described in greater than 50% of people with recurrent pain. I think it's, well, that's probably a little bit high. Osteochondral lesions in 20%, again, it's probably a little bit high, but I would say there's at least 10 that I would see in. Okay? Um, and chondral lesions in half of ankle fractures, that is true. For, I don't know if anyone here works for people who routinely scope ankles at the time of uh, uh, ankle fracture fixation, but I think that is probably pretty true. So they're pretty common. We need to split them into acute and sort of chronic osteochondral lesions. The acute ones, really, the marker is the non-weight bearing period. If you ask them how long it took them to get up on their feet again, as opposed to an ankle sprain, a lateral ligament, you know, tear, um, the lateral ligament ones get up reasonably quickly. These will often describe that it took them a couple of weeks to actually get going. There's the delayed group that often don't remember a specific trauma or remember chronic trauma. And the symptoms that they get are usually yeah. pain. Now, chondral tissue doesn't have nerves and bone doesn't have nerves. And we don't really know what causes pain in these lesions. Okay? What seems to correlate fairly well is the presence of this edema that you get underneath here. And whether it's the pressure effect that you're getting underneath that's causing the symptoms or not has been questioned. But certainly that, that's becoming an increasingly popular view. And certainly if you drill them and they fill in and the edema goes, it seems to correlate fairly well with the absence of symptoms. So it may well be a, just a, a pistoning pressure effect inside the bone that's causing their pain. They get swelling and if you get loose, you know, flaps or bits and pieces or the cartilage of trampoline, um, they can describe some catching sensations as well. The x-ray will often miss things and people talk about plantar, um, 
plant reflection AP views just so you can see more of the dome because it's not really uh, the, the part that sits end on often is too anterior to see the lesion so unless you bring the dome into direct profile with a little bit of plant reflection you can miss it. CTs are very uh, specific if there's a hole there's a hole but sometimes miss a few of these more subtle lesions and MRI scan is probably the gold standard for diagnosing this. There's lots of classification systems. I'm not going to bore you with all these. The CT one that's pretty good. An MRI one that's also pretty good. And an arthroscopic one that you're not going to routinely use when you do to classify someone when you actually get in there. These are really research based things. But really the take home message is all you've got to remember to classify them is are they displaced or undisplaced? So if we look at the acute ones, firstly, acute and undisplaced that turn up, well, you could argue, you know, you can treat conservatively often if they're, um, if they're uh, particularly if they're small, there's an argument as to whether you need to non-weight bear, bear, bear them or not. I, I tend to be fairly uh, conservative and I tell them to stay off it for a few weeks and then, uh, then weight there on them. If they're large, or they're displaced, then you probably will need to do something about it large. Okay. More than say five, six millimeters would be reasonably large. Okay, because and if they're displaced, even if they're smaller than that, you've got to get them out. So if they're uh, all you gotta remember is displaced, undisplaced for the acute one, undisplaced, probably conservative, displaced, you need to do something about it. Or if the undisplaced ones are large. Now the chronic ones, the long-standing ones, that's where it is much more controversial. So this is a fantastic article. It's a Dutch article. It's a review article in the JBJS, 2010. So in people with these chronic lesions that turn up, that appear symptomatic, what are the results of the various treatment modalities? Non-operative by just saying, do what you like and we'll see what happens. 45% of them said, yeah, um, a reasonable amount better at 12 months or more. If you're sticking in a cast for anything from three weeks to four months, about the same number said, yeah, I'm not too bad. So just time, a bit of activity modification will probably help these patients, possibly because they're not doing the activities at first. So in terms of operative, we can split this into those operations that generate fibre cartilage to fill in the gap and those that generate hyaline cartilage. And depending on if it's a competitor's lab, you can call it hyaline cartilage like if it's yours or fibre cartilage if it's somebody else's lab. But in the ones that truly generate fibre cartilage, just taking out the fragment by itself doesn't do a whole lot better than doing nothing. So there's probably not a lot of place in that. If we remove the fragment arthroscopically and scrape the base a bit, not bad. And if we scrape the base and either drill some holes burr or and you can look at however you want to just find narrow stimulation, you get pretty good results, very consistently 80 to 90%. The age of the patient hasn't been shown to, to make a difference. So you can do this in, I'm not sure that's entirely true. I think younger patients do do a bit better, but nevertheless. The results do tend to deteriorate over time. So usually these are, but in appropriate lesions, and I'll explain that in a moment, often 80% five year results are quoted where patients still feel substantially um, symptomatically better, even out to five years. What seems to correlate well though is the size or total area of the lesion. And so small lesions in the talus do as well as any bone in the body. The talus and the medial femoral condyle are great areas to do this. Okay. They behave the same. In fact, talus is probably the best bone in the body to drill. So small lesions do really well. 90% good results, very good. The large ones are the ones that tend to do poorly. 
The last thing is with the larger lesions, people have tried excising them, curetting them, filling them in with bone graft. I don't know how you contain the bone graft.